a monthly podcast on the spoken word. Episode 24, January 2020. Dialect Coaching Film and TV. A conversation with dialect virtuosa Jill McCullough. Hello. Happy New Year. Paul Mai here with my latest podcast from Paul Mai Dialect Services and the International Dialects of English Archive. First up, guess that accent. Last time I played this clip and challenged you to say where on the planet the speaker grew up. Uh, I plan to get married someday, but not right now. So, um, sometimes, yes, sometimes they ask me, when are you going to get married? Uh, but I'm not ready to do that just yet. I'm very happy being single. I like my life being single. and um, uh, I, I think the time will come when I'll find someone. If you guessed Fiji, I'm very impressed. Congratulations. It was Ideas Fiji 1, submitted by senior editor David Neville, back in 2008. The subject was born and raised on the tiny island of Batiki, in the Lomaiwichi group in Fiji. Captain Bly, cast adrift by the mutinous crew of the Bounty in 1789, was the first known European to have seen this small Fijian group of islands. 2,700 kilometres northeast of Brisbane. To hear the whole recording, search for Fiji 1 at dialectsarchive.com. Here's this month's challenge. Particularly challenging. Where did this speaker spend his formative years? A couple years later down the road, I get a phone call. Can we adopt a dog from my son and my wife? I wanted a jet black dog. They showed me a picture. Again... When they showed me a picture, it was basically a redhead, and I said, no way. They brought him home, and to this day, seven years later, he's my favorite friend. Get the answer next time on In a Manner of Speaking. My guest this month is UK-based movie dialect coach Jill McCullough, known for her work on Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, and The Last Jedi, Mary Poppins Returns. Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again, and over 100 other television and film productions. For more information about Jill, please see the Inner Manner of Speaking webpage devoted to this podcast at paulmeyer.com. Jill, I have been wanting to speak to you for 20 years. I have spoken your name aloud over 1,500 times. Every time we get a new idea sample, I have to uh, introduce it by saying... This recording, Fiji 9 or Philippines 10 or whatever it is, is copyright the International Dialects of English Archive. Karma Gets a Cure is copyright Douglas N. Onroff, Jill McCullough and Barbara Somerville. So nearly 20 years ago, you and Doug and Barbara wrote Karma Gets a Cure based on the standard lexical sets of J.C. Wells and it's the elicitation passage that every dialect speaker on idea uses. So I'm finally glad to meet you to thank you and ask you what your hand was in the creation of that passage all those years ago, if you can remember. Absolutely. It was, I mean, it was many, many years ago now. I was an adjunct professor at Yale. Doug and Bob both taught at Yale, and we ended up talking about the rainbow passage, which, as you know, was a a passage that people used in the same way that they use comma gets a cure. We were talking about it and talking about the things that were missing in it, and that actually we thought we could write a passage that contained all the sounds that we use in English, uh, some more variants. It was hilarious. We went off into a corner of Barb's flat and we sort of had a stab at writing something. I was emailing Doug recently and I said, can you remember how we all started it? And he said, you were the only one that came back with anything. (laughs) took us quite a long time to finesse it to get all the combinations of sounds and then Doug was brilliant because he took it off and made it a little bit more technical in the sense that he just made sure that it got out there in the world and that people heard it. I think if you hadn't taken it up actually, I mean a big thank you to you, you know you took it up and as you say a lot of people have used it and actually people meet me and go oh my god you're Jill McCulloch who wrote Comma Gets a Cure and of course (laughs) You forget. So I think there's no passage that I've ever seen that 
crams together all of the vowels and consonants of English as it might be spoken through all of the Englishes of the world in a in a fun, easy to read little story like this. So yeah. congratulations and thank you. I've uh, been working with it for many, many years now and uh, it, it does the trick just, just marvellously. And actually all the, the differences in all the different sounds, you know, when you hear somebody, it's phenomenal. Sarah, just even the very first, Sarah Perry. Yes. You know, the fact that an American would say Sarah Perry Sarah Perry, yeah. you know, if you got somebody, uh, Sarah Perry, you were talking about um, film stars don't die in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. So they're like Sarah Perry. Yeah. Yeah. So literally in the first two words, you know, comma gets a cure. Just yeah. in, the, in the very title. It's, you, so, it's so rich, yeah. Jill. It's so rich. Yeah. And I was just coaching an actress in, in Lisa Loomer's uh, Roe, the story of the Roe versus Wade. She's Sarah. Sarah. Her name is Sarah Weddington. Yeah. yeah. It's it's a very rich text, and thank you again for creating it all those years ago. So obviously we we use it as the elicitation diagnostic passage on idea, yeah. And people have taken it up in their own context because you've generously made it uh, free to the world as long as we cite your authorship, which I hope everybody does. So how much do you value idea and other? archives of real speakers like the British Library for suggesting models to uh, Meryl Streep and Dame Judi Dench and Alfred Molina and, and the hundreds of other well-known names you've coached. I mean, what's brilliant about IDEA, and we send everybody to IDEA, thank you for setting it up, because it is brilliant. It's so valuable for actors. Actors have to hear original sources. When I first started this job, I would have to go to the area or I would have to write to, I don't even know if you have this in America, but you'd have to write to the local tourist advisory board and you'd say, do you have any tapes of local speakers, please? Now they can just tippy tap, tap, tap and go online, you know, put in speaker of into YouTube and they'll hear somebody. But I think what's brilliant about idea is that you get a good sample you hear somebody speak the passage. You also hear them chat. Yes, the, the, the thing that I haven't yet cracked, Jill, and perhaps you have, is obviously when someone is interviewed for idea and they know they're going on an archive, they're already speaking to a world audience. They've, they're not speaking to their local audience. So they've yeah. already translated themselves into a more universal, more cosmopolitan kind of sound. And Often the, the down and dirty dialect that you need for a particular film project, it's, it's hard to, harder to come across those people speaking in their natural habitat, as it were. I think a way of doing it, actually, is to get two or three speakers of the same dialect speaking together. That's the beauty of the, uh, of the BBC collection and the British Library. Often you do get exactly that. Yeah, or, or even I think, because I use BBC Radio 4 a lot, so you might have a, you know, a programme about Wales or something, and then you'll have five or six people talking in Welsh accents or, or whatever. You know, you'll have American people, whatever it is. And I think it's the self-conscious nature of interviewees that gets in the way. Right. Are they performing? I mean, we're all performers. Every human being performs him or herself to some extent, depending on situation. They, oh, they, they code switch. They have the, their own idiolect and... And we have many, many versions of ourselves. So we're all, we're a performing species. Yeah, completely. Somebody said the other day, they were talking just in a London accent normally, and they said, anyway. And I said, have you got an Irish parent? You picked up on the Annie versus any. Anyway. And it's that sort of, and as you say, the provenance for us is we need to know that if I'm sending a dialect sample to Javier Bardem or Dame Maggie Smith or whoever, whoever it is, you're not hearing, you're hearing somebody who's from, you know, who's from New York, their parents are from New York, you know, you're, you're hearing a sort of pure accent. So you're not, you can listen to just that sound. And Jill, I go back a few more decades than you, and I'm pre-internet for sure. When I came into the business, I'm ashamed to say it now, but we 
actors based their dialect work on how other actors had done it in other films. And so there was this incestuous sort of self-referential cliche that seemed to develop to that, that uh, you know, we, we based our work on what other actors had done in the work. But interestingly, you know, we didn't have the resources then. I used to work with a company called Tamasha and they were an Indian theatre company and I was their dialect coach. And I remember there was a massive article on me in one of the big Sunday newspapers because they couldn't believe this white girl would go in and teach Indian actors Indian accents. These were people who were brought up in Birmingham and brought up in London. They'd never been to India, some of them. I couldn't go to India to do the research, so I would have to go and find people who were... Some of them I had to do Bombay, you know, a very sort of modern, uh, you know, it's a very garish color, everything the way, it's all very... You, th these people had never been to Bombay and heard this middle class sound. So I would have to go and find people from Bombay in London. I was really posh because in 19... When was it? 1982, a friend of mine bought me one of the first Sony Walkmans from New York. And I used to think I was the bee's knees with this Walkman and my cassettes. Yes. There was no way I was going to be able to go and interview women who worked on building sites in Rajasthan. So I would have to study it from the oldest people I could find from Rajasthan here and then find a way to teach these young Indian ac actors how to do it. It was very high. I'm going to step away from my mic a bit. So they would talk. A lot of the time, I want to go home. So the sound was really, really high. Yes. And really, but of course, you can't do a play, the whole play. You know, my bracelets, ah, ah, ah. and you can't do the whole play like that. So you've got to find an artistic license and a way of being able to teach the actors. Yes, it's a science, but it's an art. Yeah, completely. Jill, let's blow our own trumpets just a little bit and suggest that dialect work, dialect coaching, dialect performance, dialects are not simply a cosmetic, something that's pasted onto the surface of a performance. It's integral to the performance. It's integral to the storytelling of the project. So why are dialect coaches listed so far down in the credits? Why are we not listed as dialect designers along with other designers on a project? What do you mean, why is my credit near the dog? Exactly. After the unit nurse and the dog handler. I have a producer friend who literally wrote my contract. You will be above the dog. Not even the dog handler above. You will be above the dog. <laughs> that this is, as you say, it's an integral part of the filming process and more, I think, than it ever was. Uh, and actors really do often rely on the coach. Yeah. And I think actually it's up to us to fight that battle. Yes, we need to advocate for our own corner of yep. the industry don't we I so mean, often i'm called in to dialect coach someone who who's on set tomorrow in yeah. the accent there's no other part of film preparation that would be so cavalier and and delay the, the hiring of the specialist and until the the absolute moment that it's needed i mentioned band of brothers to you earlier some of those boys got cast the night before what it takes is prep and what it takes is sort of owning the accent. So the accent comes from inside and it's not added on outside. I want to get to the point where the actor's not even thinking about the accent. They're thinking about the accent in a strange, semi-divine, mystical way. If, if an actor is thinking about how his or her lines are coming out of his or her mouth, then the audience in a semi-divine, mystical way picks up on that. That's where their attention is. And I completely agree with that, Paul. I completely—I don't even think it's semi-mystical. I'll say to an actor, you don't know what that word means, do you? And they say, no, I don't. And they say, how do you, how do you know? And I say, because I can hear the way you say it, that you don't know what it means. So you're not giving it its resonance. It's the, just the fullness of the weight of the sound. So you sit back off the word fractionally or what a line means. And I think it's exactly the same with accent. And the other thing is, I think you've got this layer between you and your line. Now I'm actually, as a dialect coach, I'm very committed to text. So I would much rather, now you may hate me for this, Paul, I'd rather somebody did a semi-good accent and a brilliant performance than a brilliant accent and a semi-good performance. I completely agree with you. And, and when I'm coaching someone for an audition, 
I will say you'll get the job not because you can do the accent as we've done it, but because you're a brilliant actor. And the acting must always trump the dialect. The, the, the acting must always lead the way. It, yeah. it must be the thing that's in the foreground. If, if the dialect is in the foreground, then we've got some sort of uh, academic textbook uh, imitation of, of something without life. Yeah, and I think if the dialect's in the foreground, we haven't done our job. I tell actors that if you're complimented on your dialect work, you may have very well have done it wrong. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's, that's great. Because that's not where the audience's attention should have been. And actually, interestingly, I've coached jobs where there may be, well, it was years ago, it was a theatre production called Jeffrey. Everybody in it was British and needed to be American apart from one actress. And in the reviews, it got amazing reviews and they were saying this is amazing for this all British cast to do a great accents apart from... <laughs> and, they, and they criticized the one American. And it was like, oh, my God. That leads me on to another question. As everyone knows, movies take weeks and weeks to make. Sometimes there are hundreds of people in the cast. Many of the actors never meet each other. Scenes are shot weeks and weeks apart. So my question is, how do you maintain consistency across the shoot? How do you keep everyone wrangled into the same dialect world? I think, I think what you often have to do is design the world first. Either the world is given to you, as in it's set here, uh, but something like Band of Brothers, for example, they were from all over. So what you have to do before that, you get the first four scripts, for example, the first four hours of it. You break down as many accents as you can. And that was with the fantastic Jessica Drake, who I'm sure you know. Yes. And Jess started the job. And you break down all of the accents in all of the, I mean, that's a massive job. I think I taught something like 400 men for Band of Brothers and you're breaking down all the different accents so in that one you're actually specifically teaching them the accent of E Company you know which, whichever character they were playing because they were based on real characters but if it's something where you're creating a world the Game of Thrones prequel you just make a decision and then you sort of tell the actors what you're going to do. And I break it all down on a sheet, whether you're going, to, you're going to give them the vowels, the consonants, the rhythm. I love to teach as many people as possible at one time. So if I could teach a load of actors in one go in a group for a theater, sh for a movie, say they're in rehearsal, give me 20 actors, I'm really happy. You can teach them all at the same time, tell everybody what the world is that you're creating. And then you specifically take them one by one and go through what their problems are. Because every actor's got a different problem. Some of them may find words difficult. Some of them may find the rhythm. Some of them may take the accent too big. So once you've created the world, you're then dealing with the specificities of everybody's needs. Yes, everyone's preferred learning style, if you wish. Some actors never want to put the dialect onto the text, onto the dialogue, until the moment they begin shooting. They want to keep that moment of freshness for when they first speak the dialect, first speak the dialogue in context, and prefer to learn the dialect on other material. Some actors are completely different. They, they want you to tell them how every word and every phrase is to be pronounced. Absolutely. I've got actors who will not touch the text. I've got other actors who we will break down every single word. So I will write it out phonetically. I'll do it in colours highlighters to show different vowel sounds yeah i do that too but sometimes you'll give actors recordings you'll do everything for them so they're completely they've got every angle covered and exactly as you say it's, it's difficult I, I find it difficult when they don't want to look at the script actually and i think that's my fear i'm going to play a clip from the iron lady but precede it with a recording of maggie thatcher herself addressing the house of commons we are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, did America go, cap in hand, and ask Tojo for a peaceful negotiation of terms? 
Did she turn her back on her own citizens there? Because the islands were thousands of miles away from the mainland United States? No! No, no! We will stand on principle, or we will not stand at all. That must have been a huge thrill for you, Jill, to be the dialect coach on The Iron Lady. I'm always citing that film as uh, the preeminent example of how dialect work should be done in the films. Phenomenal, isn't it? Tell us yeah. the story about the, about the way that project came together. I think Meryl Streep gets all the credit for that. And all of her dialect work is very specific, very clear, very technical and precise. Even though I was able to give her some feedback, essentially, she's done all the work. Essentially, I'd like to be able to big myself up and say, oh, what a genius I was getting Meryl Streep there. <laughs> but actually, I, I think when you hear any of her dialect work, you hear this person who, I mean, funnily enough, I was listening to her do it the other day, and I just thought, listen to how she's lowered the register of her voice. Yes. Listen to how she's paced the line. Listen to how she specifically used a staccato, just the way she sort of, the onset in some of the, so in the way Thatcher would, I know. I would have to teach most actors for two years to get to the level that Meryl Streep starts at. Yes. Actually, I have to take all the credit for Meryl Streep's performance. I'm joking like because um, uh, George Clooney loves to tell the story on talk shows of how he sent Meryl a, uh, a copy of my accents and dialects for stage and screen, um, saying, I think you could use a little help. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to, although I was the butt of the practical joke, I'm going to take, I'm going to take the credit for it. Take it. She was terrible before she read that. <laughs> Undoubtedly. So what are you working on currently, Jill? I'm teaching a couple of really difficult accents at the moment. I was mentioning to you about teaching Geordie. Um, for those people listening who don't know what Geordie is, it's Newcastle, which is the northeast of England, and it's a really unusual accent and quite difficult to do. And some people might know it from um, Billy Elliot. It's a really great accent to do. And a lot of English people, they all go like, why I, man? Sometimes what actors do is they play the overall tune of the accent. They, yes. they, they get seduced by the music of it. Exactly. And then when you're doing it, you think, oh, good, great. I sound, I can hear myself do it. I can hear myself do it. So they tend to, every line they do, they have to do that sort of tune because then they can hear themselves sounding Geordie. Or the same in Northern Irish, which is when... Because that's a very yeah. seductive melody as well, isn't it? And Northern Irish is a really difficult accent to do. But when somebody can hear themselves do it, when they do that wee bounce... Which da, 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 da. Exactly. But it almost sounds like, um, I describe it as like a wee bounce on a trampoline. Mm -hmm. But then they put the wee bounce in every line. And so every line sounds the same. And what you get is somebody who speaks like that. And it just, it isn't real. <laughs> it's dead annoying as well. You want to top yourself because it's like, stop it, stop talking. And what you need to do is just rain it down, turn it down a little tiny bit. And I think that's a really great thing for actors to learn is that sort of sense of sometimes less is more. I've forgotten the name of the actor who played the dad in Billy Elliot. He's a Scot, isn't he? This is a very interesting story because I was the second or third coach, I think, on Billy Elliot. Uh, they phoned me up, so I went in and I met Gary Lewis, who is a mm. wonderful actor fantastic Scottish accent, Glasgow um, actor. I sat down for my first session with him and within a minute of working with him, as I'm sure you, we've been doing this a long time, Paul, and I'm sure you have the same sort of thing as me, which is you know very, very quickly whether somebody can do this or not and you know it doesn't matter how much work, they're not going to be able to get it. Sometimes it's better to leave the actor do their own accent. Gary'd never trained. And this was a very moving, intense story about a mining town. For Gary not to be Geordie was a massive thing. For him to be the father of this boy who 
set in this mining town, not to do the same accent as the sun would sort of be awful. But I remember going to Stephen Daldry and the producer and I said, don't make this actor do the accent. Am I allowed to swear on your podcast? Oh, yes. I said, you're going to fuck up your movie. Because he would lose his emotional intensity to his line if he was doing another sound. He needed to have his own access to his... His emotional in- intelligence. Exactly. And his wonderful work in the film, an absolute triumph, goes to prove that acting trumps dialect every time. Well, I think you might notice it and you might go, oh, he's Scottish. But then because the acting is so great, you start to rationalise. Oh, well, he's, you know, he's uh, got this and that influence in his life. And you you make up stories to, exactly. to accommodate that. That's exactly what you do. I think it's really interesting. It's one of the decisions. It's one of the decisions I'm most proud of to actually fight for the actor to not do the accent. To make yourself it, redundant, in other, in other words, in, in that sense. Because that strength of accent matches the strong Geordie accent. The same character and cultural overtones were there, I expect. And now to talk about a different Jamie Bell movie. Film stars don't die in Liverpool. Tell us a story. I've taught Jamie quite a few times, actually. Jamie, I did... um, He and Mia Vashikovska and Michael Fassbender, Mia Vashikovska, who's Australian, all did a Yorkshire accent for Jane Eyre. And then he came back and said, "I, I want to do Liverpool. And again, Liverpool is one of those accents that it's um, what's interesting about Liverpool, and again, Liverpool is in the northwest of England for your listeners who might not know. Liverpool is one of those accents that very often gets cast as a scally, which is a, a, a rascal or a criminal, or um, that's not what a scally means. But if you were going to have, you, you'd have the cheeky lad or lass from Liverpool, if that's what you're going to cast. And so what Jamie needed was he needed this very sort of a sort of sensitive sound in order to, and also a period Liverpool sound, which is um, not quite, it's got a different quality to it. It didn't need to be sort of selling itself. It just was sort of sat in there as sort of like, this is how, this is how he talks, you know, and it's not something that's, so again, you're sort of playing against type in accent. And I don't know if you have this as much in America. This might be interesting for you to tell me is that we have, you know, if you're going to have like the wide boy, you're going to cast a Londoner, you're going to have London. If you're going to have somebody who's funny or, you know, whatever, you might cast them from Wales. If you're going to have somebody, if you want them to sound slightly as if they're not quite the brightest person in the bunch, you're going to cast them as Birmingham. We have, we have sort of stereotypes. It's not true, but we have stereotypes and the Liverpool's the scally. I would suspect that every country has stereotypes, wouldn't you, Jill? Yeah. We, we certainly have them here. People believe to this day that everyone in New York sounds, you know, like Godfather, you know. And of course, it's simply not the case. And yeah. most of the inhabitants of New York, even, even those native-born, would not be identified as New Yorkers by the rest of the country if they heard them speak. What accent do you like teaching, Paul? Oh, it would be so hard to pick and choose among the nearly 30 dialects and accents that I publish dialect manuals on, and many of them covering the same accents that you've demonstrated with such virtuosity. I enjoy teaching myself uh, Afrikaans, which is such, such a difficult to, and very strange accent to do. Uh, Northern Ireland, I, have to, I had to, to teach myself that one too. Didn't come nearly as uh, instantly to me as, as the Irish accent had done years and years ago. I enjoy American Southern accents. My wife is a Kentuckian. I've lived in the South and I have a great sympathy for the Southern culture. And I've seen Hollywood butcher Southern films a lot and misunderstand them. And actors often just bring to the table some of their editorializing about the Southern culture, uh, robbing it of some of its dignity. So it's, it's fun to point out that, for instance, a, a, a Southerner might say time and tide, but tight and, and and like. So depending on the context of that vowel, the drawl may be there or not. But let's get back to you. 
Let's talk about uh, coaching on set, sitting in the mud and in the blazing sun versus simply prepping actors uh, before they go off to slog through the mud and endure the, the sun and the wind and the rain. I don't travel as much. I've got two small kids, so I will prep a lot of movies. If they shoot in London, I can do it. I've done my sort of shooting all over the world. And I'll do the filming if it's here. If it's away, all their scenes are recorded and I break down the scenes into scene number. So they will get the recording for every single scene. And you just make sure that you, having done all the work, you play the scene the night before. So this is the act of recording the scene in prep. When we're happy with the dialect, we will record. And also sometimes, I don't know whether you find this, I'm somebody, and not all coaches are the same, I know some coaches don't model the accent, but I do a lot of modeling. So I'm very happy, if, as long as I'm confident with the accent. But what I will do is they, actors will often ask me to record the lines. Mm -hmm. And I will do it very slowly. And I won't give them acting tune. I might mm. give them five or six different tunes. And then they get a chance to listen to it. The other thing they do sometimes is they record it when they're happy. Mm -hmm. So they get a chance to listen to themselves when they were sort of secure in the knowledge of all those sounds. Of course, they get to the set and there's, there are new scenes thrown at them every day, and, and which you haven't uh, prepped. <laughs> if I've got enough prep time with them, they should be able to improvise in accent. Or we've got ADR. Automated dialogue replacement, sometimes referred to as looping or dubbing. So, so you don't always have to fix dialect mistakes in the field, on the location, on the set. You can... Save them for the ADR session. And sometimes directors will say, I don't care, there's a plane flying over. We're going to record this scene now and we'll get it in ADR. Perhaps even with a different actor voicing the part. Yes, my friend, yes. That's a tragedy. It's happened on films of mine. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you, but, you get called into looping and you're coaching a different actor to yeah. replace the dialogue that, yeah. that, the, that the, uh, the locally hired actor did. Yeah, yeah. And um, we were talking about ADR uh, earlier, and um, I did a really interesting film with Alfonso Cuaron, uh, Children of Men. Tell us about Children of Men. Claire Hope Asherty, when they originally recorded the film, did a London accent. When we looped it, they decided to change it to African. So we went through the whole of the film. We replaced every single sound that she made with an African accent. And we had to sort of observe sort of the shapes of her mouth and work out how we could put in some sounds that would make her sound. So we would look at the shape and whether she could say mick or make or however she was saying it in London to match, to give her because they wanted the different quality in the film. And, and very, very hard to do when she's in close up, of course. Absolutely. Uh, that a London accent wouldn't visually match in the musculature with yeah. uh, an African accent because the rhythms are so very different. It's got to translate visually, but uh, I'm sure you've pulled it off. Can't wait to see that one either. Let's finish up with talking about your new agency. I think you're going to have an opportunity to uh, to advocate for the status of our of our craft. Tell us about the new agency. <laughs> I often get, when I go on to new films, I will get actors who say, oh, I don't want a dialect coach. And I'll say, why? And very often it's because they haven't had a good experience with a dialect coach. And directors can be a little bit uh, cagey about dialect coaches. And over the years, that's really perturbed me. It's really upset me that people sort of have a some people, not everybody, but there are negative connotations. Yes, we don't have that about cinematographers, do we? Absolutely not. But people will say, no, 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 uh, I worked with a dialect coach and it ruined my performance. And what I decided to do was I wanted to work with coaches who I thought were brilliant and train them to be able to offer a really excellent service. And so they give a very consistent service within the industry so they are all trained to a really high level they add an extra what i believe is an extra dimension to the work so they will make sure when they're on set even the people who aren't doing dialects 
they'll knock on everybody's trailer doors in the morning and they'll say, do you want to run the lines? You know, do you want to do some work before you go on set? Do you want me to help you run lines the night before? Do you want to, you know, whatever. So we're just making sure that actors feel safe. We're not directors. And I think sometimes dialect coaches can be viewed by some people in our industry as a, as, as usurping a prerogative of some kind that we get in the way and it's a very fine line isn't it yes i've sometimes gotten myself into trouble in that way trying to walk that fine line and uh, perhaps overstep the mark but you know you live and learn and you keep walking that that fine line yeah but i think the problem with that is our work not only is it not only do we Accent isn't just about one word. It isn't just about the way you say car or dog or whatever it is. It's about how you say the dog was in the car. The dog was in the car, depending on how you say that, gives me some information. So the tune... It tells the story. Yeah, and we have to give the actor lots of options. And I think sometimes dialect coaches have... They're too prescriptive, perhaps. Prescriptive, yeah, over-prescriptive. And I think what we need to do is get out of the way and offer actors this really superb service. Back to our very original point, which is the credit in the industry, people will start seeing that we're really valuable on a production. You know, I, I can get two of the most famous people in the world practicing a scene together before they go on set. That saves production time and money. That may very well be your immense legacy to this industry. Not that you haven't, with your 100 plus film and television credits, uh, already left a substantial legacy. But thank you. Thank you for talking with me. Thank you for starting this new agency. Good luck with it. It's a pleasure to talk to you. So thanks very much for interviewing me. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thanks to you for joining Jill McCullough and me, Paul Meyer. The film clips used in this episode are used under the copyright doctrine of fair use. You can follow Paul My Dialect Services on Facebook and me on Twitter, at Dialect Paul. And of course, if you want to learn any of the accents Jill and I talked about, my nearly 30 manuals come in three formats and are available online from Amazon and paulmy.com. You can even put the icing on the cake with a personal Skype session with me. For another topic on the spoken word, join me next time for In a Manner of Speaking. <laughs>